Wonderful job, Larry. Although I have some, some bad news for you. Well, Al Gore says we're all in it for the money. <laughs> Al, if you're out there watching, listening, I'll gladly trade my salary with yours, my job with yours, my car with yours, my house with yours, my lifestyle with yours. Well, maybe not my lifestyle. <laughs> you can keep the lifestyle. Um, but, it, but one other note that I found pretty interesting at the very end there, Larry, when you talked about uh, Ehrlich predicting a, a billion people dying from famine, we ought to get him together with the President Emeritus of the World Wildlife Fund because, as you recall, he says he'd like to come back as a super virus that would devastate mankind. So get those two together and, hey. Our next speaker is the Executive Director of the International Climate Science Coalition, Tom Harris is regularly published in newspapers in Canada and in the U.S. and occasionally in Australia, New Zealand, the U.K. and other countries. He is often interviewed on radio and television. He is past executive director of the Natural Resources Stewardship Project. And for the past three years, he has taught climate change and earth sciences perspective, which is a second year course in the Faculty of Sciences at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. Very prolific writer, my friend Tom Harris. Well, thank you, James, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm using the radio lapel mic because I'm not sure where I'll have to stand. I may have to go down there so I can read the slides to you. Um, I'm going to be talking today about how cultural worldview actually plays a greater role in the public's belief or disbelief of points of view on controversial issues like climate change. This is very disturbing, of course, for science educators because it tells us that, in fact, the importance of science literacy and numeracy has been grossly overrated in comparison with other factors. And I'd like to start out with a bit of a story. I went to the 2009 convention in um, Copenhagen where the UN were having their big meeting, and I reserved to stay in the home of an upper-middle-class Danish family. And I researched them a bit before I went, and I found out that they were actually activists in the left-wing Copenhagen community. So I thought, well, I better not tell them why I'm here. <laughs> so one day down at breakfast, the lady looked at me across the table, and she said, we know why you're here. <laughs> they had researched me. <laughs> and I, I thought, uh-oh, maybe I'm going to have to find somewhere else to live. But before I could get too uncomfortable, she said, but we agree with you. You see, we're actually friends of... Turn on the microphone, or change the slide here. There we go. We're friends of this person, uh, the person who produced this video, okay? This is um, The Cloud Mystery, which is an exceptional film. It expands on what you actually saw. Oh, there we go. I should be looking here. Uh, <laughs> It expands on what you saw from Nir Shaviv this morning, okay? If you want to learn more about that, this is really a phenomenal film. And they're friends with Lars Mortensen, my landlady was. So she said, yeah, we understand CO2 is probably not a major driver of climate change. We think that it's probably the sun. And I was amazed, you know, very strong-wing left, left activists, uh, and they were actually climate skeptics. And she said to me, but where does a climate skeptic who's on the left turn? <laughs> I mean... I said, well, what do you do? Do you bring it up in your meetings with your left-wing uh, friends? And she said, oh, no, we never bring that up. Uh, and so I explained to her that, well, one of our objectives with ICSC was to try to expand the tent to include people who were not our traditional allies on the right. And so she was very friendly about that. And for the rest of the week, we got along great, and I didn't have to worry. But, you know, it, it really brought home to me the idea that maybe we should look at why would it be that left-wingers, generally speaking, are climate alarmists and right-wingers, generally speaking, are not. And there's some very good papers that have just come out from Harvard, or I should say Yale University, change the slide here, called the Cultural Cognition Project. And I'm going to put links to these papers actually on our website over the next day or two. And the thing I'm going to focus on most in this particular talk is what's called the Second National Risk and Culture Study. And this was, it's about four years old, but the more recent papers will be up there as well. I'll be referencing them too. And what they found out was that you can divide the population, first of all, you've probably seen this before, into kind of a grid like this. You have hierarchists, 
above, you have egalitarians below, and to the right, strangely enough, to the right, <laughs> you have communitarians, uh, people who believe that the good of the many outweighs the good of the individual, okay, so they're communitarians, and individualists on the left. And, you know, there are various characteristics that are associated with these kinds of people. For example, you can see in the upper left-hand corner, again, a strange positioning on this, this graph considering what side of the political spectrum it is. These are people who support uh, industry, technology, and they don't think there's a great deal of risk, while people who are communitarian and egalitarian, they think there's a lot of risk to industry, okay? So they're traditionally going to be against the oil companies and people like that. Now, I'm just going to touch on a few of the conclusions they came to from very detailed studies that they did across the United States over a number of years. And the point of this is not just to substantiate ICSC's approach, which is this nonpartisan approach approach, but it's also because it gives us clues as to how we help pull people from one political persuasion over to another on these kinds of controversial issues. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is the response of the public based on their worldview to this question. I'll just let you read that. Now that's, that question is a rather silly question. I mean, many people in the audience would say, well, it's not a question of whether global warming is a risk. It's a question of is there human-caused dangerous global warming? And that's the real question. But the authors of the paper maintain that most people's understanding of the issue is not sophisticated enough that it really makes any difference. You don't have to break it down into subtitles and if, then, what, what about, you know? This kind of question, stupid as it may seem to scientists, actually is a good indicator of whether or not people think that we're causing dangerous global warming. And as you can see here, I'll just pull out my pointer and I'll pop down to the front, you can see that as you proceed, essentially from, um, I'll go over here, as you proceed from the left of the screen, which in this case is left wing, uh, egalitarian over to more hierarchical, the belief in the danger, and that is the red line, the, the belief in the danger actually shrinks, okay? And that's partly because it fits their worldview. Now, let's take a look at the next slide, which shows the same kind of plot, but uh, in a different direction. In other words, going from communitarian over to individualistic. The graph looks almost the same, okay? And when we put them side by side, it's almost hard to tell them apart. And so, in fact, in later papers, the Yale researchers actually just lumped together hierarchical and uh, individualist, individualists, they just lump them together, and essentially that's right wing. And they come up with a graph like this that shows that uh, hierarchical individuals see little risk due to man-made global warming, while egalitarian communitarians see a lot of risk, okay? So that's the first thing I wanted to show you. That's just an observation on their part. It doesn't give us much clue as to how we can pull people over, but we'll see that in a second. Now, the other thing I'd like to show you, and by the way, these papers are much too detailed to organize in a 15-minute talk. It sort of reminds me of when Einstein, in 1950, was asked on a radio show. The host said, um, we have 60 seconds left in our radio show. Uh, do you think you could summarize the theory of general relativity for our audience? <laughs> and Einstein just paused and said, no. <laughs> so I guess they had a lot of dead air time, or maybe more commercial time. But anyway, here's the next thing I'll show you. They are two articles written here, and the purpose of this part of the report, and you don't have to read the details, all you have to know is that it's a climate alarmist article, reporting on climate alarmist research, okay? So the actual science part of these two articles is identical. The only difference is the conclusion, the recommended policy solution for the two um, approaches. On the left, the people are recommending that there be more taxes, okay, more control on what they call pollution, which of course isn't really pollution, we're CO2. So this article here is just talking about the same thing as this one, but it concludes there should be very strong taxes, there should be really powerful anti-pollution measures. This article, on the other hand, recommends nuclear power. Now let's take a look at the response of people with different worldviews to the exact same story, the same scientific research, but just due to a change in the conclusion, the policy conclusion. What we have here is the perception of risk, okay? It's considered greater risk the higher you are on this graph. The red is communitarian, which as you remember is one element, I, should, I suppose you could say, of left wing, and the dotted blue are individualists. And this is the control before they're given the article, okay? Then they're given the article and they're asked the question, how dangerous is human-caused global warming? And look at this, the communitarians think that the anti-pollution article proves that it's obviously very dangerous. But when they're told, but the solution is nuclear, 
oh, well, maybe it's not quite so dangerous. <laughs> and similarly down here, the individualist hierarchical people who actually in this case individualists who don't like seeing government interference in things, they feel after they've read the article, different conclusion, same data, that in fact the risk of global warming caused by humans is really actually less. It's not that serious after all. And when they're told it's nuclear power, which a lot of them support, big industry, it's man's mastery over nature, oh well then maybe there is more risk, okay? <laughs> now the same trend, a little bit less, a little flatter graphs, actually occurs in the case of egalitarians versus hierarchians, okay? You can see, and if you put them side by side, the two shapes are exactly the same. So what this tells you is that the conclusions to your work, in other you can present, and I'll show you the skeptics in a second, you can present exactly the same information, but if you conclude something that does not match the worldview of your audience, they'll suddenly discount all the information you just presented to them. So let's go back and actually pretend that we're going to have an article here written on the climate skeptics side. Okay, the climate skeptics, they're presenting all the data of Nirsha Viv or Fred Singer and they're showing therefore that we probably don't have a CO2 driven climate catastrophe. But let's say the conclusion of the article on the left was, eh, so don't do anything. Okay, I don't know how many left wingers would just support you then. <laughs> but regardless, let's say the conclusion on the right was therefore we have to help the poor of the world adapt to climate change. We really must help these people, okay, because they're desperate, they need our help. Look at the, the Sahel in, in East Africa, or West Africa. Well, what they would find is exactly the same shape curve, okay, uh, and, and that's, that's really amazing because it really tells you that you actually have to give a little bit to, to your opponents from a worldview point of view if you're to pull them over to climate realism. Um, by the way, this sort of thing would also work if the solution uh, that they proposed for the alarmists was things like uh, geoengineering, okay? If that was the solution, you'd find a lot more people on the uh, individualistic and hierarchical side would support that the data was correct. Now, the next thing I'm going to talk about is, um, get through here, the different types of worldview of the advocate actually matters too. It's not just the audience, but the actual worldview of the advocate. And I'll just quickly identify a few people here. This conservative looking fellow up here, and this guy down here is, well, perhaps not conservative. Uh, <laughs> somebody up here, this might be a UN person, communitarian but hierarchist, you know, believing that they run the world, but that somehow it's going to be shared, but not, you know, there's, they're up there. Uh, and then you'd have down here individualists. So they didn't actually study what impact the perceived worldview of the actual advocate has on the audience, but on, on global warming, but they did study it on another controversial issue which really relates to this. And that is the controversy over HPV vaccination, okay, where generally conservatives are against mandatory vaccination for girls 11, 12, that sort of age, um, because they're afraid it will encourage sexual promiscuity. But left-wingers are generally in favor of it. So here's the study results. This is amazing. This shows how the perceived worldview, social and cultural worldview of the advocate greatly impacts whether or not the audience believes exactly the same facts. And what they did here is they first of all showed, um, okay, there's no argument, the public start down here. Generally, they don't know much about the issue. They consider the risk to be fairly low. Okay, the benefits outweigh the risk. If you get a vaccine when you're that age, you have practically no chance of developing cervical cancer. But as they learn more, you can see they tend to become more polarized. Hierarchists uh, feel the risks are actually greater than egalitarians. But now look, let's see what happens if the people presenting the argument are the expected people. Okay, so your advocate against vaccines is a conservative, okay? They're a hierarchical individualist. Well, you find that hierarchical individualists then are more believed okay, by audiences like that, and slightly less believed. It doesn't really make much difference in the case of um, you know, having the, the expected orientation. But if you actually switch the orientation, where you have someone like Governor Perry arguing in favor of compulsory vaccination, okay, that was what he did actually, and very different, people didn't expect that. And you see a sudden drop in the hierarchist view of the risks, okay? They consider now the risks, well, and not so much. You know, somebody who shares my worldview 
actually um, believes in mandatory vaccination. While the egalitarians, they think, oh, well, it's, maybe it's more risky. Okay? Now, this isn't too dramatic. I won't talk about the last one here. It's just when both sides have the same um, political orientation. But look what happens in this. This is amazing. They actually change completely the side of the argument that they support if, in fact, there's an unexpected orientation. In other words, essentially, an individualist uh, is supporting the mandatory vaccination side. Okay, that's, that's what we're having here. And what you find then is that communitarians actually feel there is more risk than do people who are individualists in the audience. Okay, so what that shows us is that the actual political orientation of the advocate is just about as important as the orientation of the audience and the conclusions. Now, you know, this is, this is really kind of scary because it does indicate to us that we have to be very careful who's giving the messages. And maybe we do have to give a certain amount uh, to our audience if they're not of the same political persuasion as we are. Um, I drew a graph here, and I wanted to show, based on what I've said today, how much more time do I have? Maybe another five minutes? Okay. This is a graph I drew where uh, virtually every dot represents something like 10,000 people in the population. And it's not centered about the zero mark because, in fact, you know, the, the, you know most, most centrists are still climate alarmists. We haven't pulled that many over yet. But what you see here is that the right wing generally have a more dense number of uh, people down here where they say there is weak support for dangerous anthropogenic uh, climate change, okay? So that's generally where most right-wingers will fall. Unfortunately, there's a lot of right-wingers up here in the nuclear industry, for example, who are actually in support of the DAG theory, the dangerous anthropogenic global warming theory. On the left, of course, a very, very dense group of people. Well, dense can be taken in more ways than one, I guess. But uh, <laughs> anyway, a very dense group of dots up here that indicate the further left you go, the more they are actually supporting the idea, the hypothesis of dangerous human-caused climate change. Now, based on what I was just explaining to you, um, let's look at what kind of a target audience you should be choosing if you're trying to convince people of a point of view um, if you have a particular orientation in your organization. Well, first of all, I would say that strongly capitalist advocates are totally wasting their time talking to people on the far left, maybe even in the center. Okay, this is their target audience. Now, this is important because you've got to notice that many of the right-wingers are still up in the climate alarmist area. Okay, so that's a very important target area, I would suggest, for people like CEI, okay? Uh, they, I'm sure they already do this, but there are a lot of right-wingers, industrialists, who support the um, sky, climate scare, and they are obviously a very receptive audience to somebody from CEI. Now, let's look at a next group, moderately capitalist advocates, okay? They can expand a bit further to the left. They might not be hard enough for people on the far right, but they would have this kind of an audience. These people already agree with them. This group up here are people to be convinced, okay? And people you have a good chance of convincing because you share their worldview. Um, politically neutral and nonpartisan advocates, I wouldn't say they can center right on zero because it's still considered right wing, no matter how nonpartisan you try to be, which we were trying to be, uh, we're still considered right wing by a lot of people. We purposely put out more press releases con criticizing the conservatives, not only because they're the government uh, and they hold the, the, you know, the, the, the strings to the purse, but also because we're trying to undo the idea that we are right wing, okay? We are nonpartisan, and we see our audience as, as actually quite big, and that's the approach that we're taking, okay? Now, just to whet your appetite to look at the rest of these papers, I want to show you something that will make you very happy, <laughs> but also something that will surprise you. This graph asks the question, or this survey, it's a general population question. They haven't divided it up into kinds of audience or kinds of advocates. They just said, how much risk do you believe climate change poses to human health, safety, and prosperity? And the happy thing about this graph is that as people learn more, as they become more scientifically literate, they become a little bit less alarmist. Okay, that's a good thing to hear. It tells us that, yes, there is a role to be played in science literacy. It's just not as strong as we thought, and we have to consider other factors. But this is the interesting comparison between hierarchical individuals and um, egalitarians. Take a look at this. Um, as they learn more, these people, hierarchical individualists, they actually become more and more skeptical. That's not surprising. It's supporting their worldview. Similarly, up here, egalitarian communitarian, 
they become more and more alarmist. Okay? Now that's a problem. Do you, do, what do you do? Do you not want to educate the people on the left then because they're going to become more alarmist when you do that? What we'd like to see is we'd like to see something that, like this. This is a question about how dangerous is nuclear power. And if Jay, uh, Jay Lear is here, I'm sure he'll be very happy to see this because on both sides of the spectrum, both left and right, the more they learn about science, as their science uh, literacy increases, the less risk they feel is posed by nuclear power. And that, that's a very good finding. There's one bad aspect of this graph, and that is that it, despite the fact they're both dropping, it actually becomes more polarized. In other words, the difference between opinion actually increases. <clears throat> so what I would suggest is that when you're looking at these papers, the real target of using this research, and I find it really exceptionally good research, and, and they, the authors answer questions, okay? They didn't know which side of the spectrum I was on. Uh, I think they were assuming that I was on the other side, but regardless, um, they're very good. They answer quite quickly if you have questions. How does it apply in this circumstance or whatever? But I think what we're shooting for here, basically, is to draw these two not only both down, like in the nuclear case, but to also um, bring them closer together. So there's less polarization, okay? There's less difference between people of differing worldviews. So that's our goal. And if you'd like to learn more, this is where you go. Our homepage will be putting up two things. The papers, there's about five papers that detail this information. And also there's an hour-long presentation by a really excellent science journalist by the name of Jay Ingram, where he goes into all kinds of details about how scientific literacy does help, but nowhere near as much as the social position of the audience or the advocate. So it's very new research, some of it as recently as this year. And I recommend you go have a look.